Well, thank you everybody for uh, coming back for this final session. Um, I've been asked to chair this final session. Um, my name is Steve Paul and I'm the Honorary Treasurer. Um, and um, what we're going to have is a platform discussion, um, as it says in your thing first, a conference debate. Then uh, Peter Gilchrist will then do a final kind of sort of wrap up of the conference. Um, which he's already prepared. So I want to keep things going, so I would like to make a start. The, the three speakers are uh, Chris Smiley, uh, Max Wade, and Jonas Bradley. They're each going to take the topic um, in, from their own perspective. Um, they're going to have between five and 10 minutes. So hopefully that will give us about 15, 20 minutes for an open discussion on the topic, which is what could the profession look like in 10 years' time? Will technology have changed the profession beyond recognition? Which I think is going to be quite an interesting aspect. So um, if we could have Chris, please, to start. chance you went because uh, and whatever you studied was the interest of the lecturer and that has changed it's about the student and the main driver being you're paying nine thousand pounds a year to go now what do you want for that nine thousand pounds a job at the end of it which might sound well we always did did we when you went to university did you take um, a, a degree in environmental biology or whatever because you thought there was a career in wildlife conservation at the end of it? I didn't, I just took it because it was interesting. So how can we get people to actually get a job? That's make them industry ready and how is that going to be achieved? Um, industry liaison meetings. Get industry in, tell us what we actually need to do. We, we, get the, we, we do these currently at um, Scotland's Rural College where I am, and a number of other universities do them, but by no means all. And from there, we can change the syllabus. Now we get, as I say, we do these meetings and we get a lot of people in from country parks and local authorities. We get very few colleges coming in, even though I actually invite very many colleges. We get very few people in. What we've been told, is they want project management, they want financial management. So we've changed the syllabus where they actually run their own range of service. They project manage it, they have to get the resources, and if they don't have the resources, they've got to fill in a grant application form, a real grant, to get real money so they can progress with it. So we can change the syllabus according to what you need. Student research projects often come out of my mind or the students' minds. We do work with outside bodies, Again, it tends to be local authorities, national trust, that kind of thing. Very rarely do we do it with a consultancy. Occasionally, but it's pretty rare. Um, and I, I think we should, I think we've probably got a lot of questions that you want answered. And with work experience, along with the student projects, you'll be able to assess students trying to get into the profession rather than them having to finish the degree, come out, spend two years working for no pay, and then trying to get in at the very bottom rung. So we lose a lot of brilliant ecologists, some better than me to be honest, because they, they can't get a job, and they have to take a job in agriculture or something like that, and, and that keeps going, they, they can't leave it in the end. So yeah, we need to do cutting edge technology. Research is always going to be that. Um, I'm talking about the education side at the moment. We don't always do cutting edge technology in academia, in the education side anyway. So sometimes we do need guest lecturers coming in 
we happen to be pretty good at um, drones, but we're not good at um, some other stuff. And the, the students enjoy it as well, it inspires them, you get to meet them, you get to pick out people as well that you might want for the work experience or the research projects. That happens, it definitely happens. Uh, and they just enjoy it. We've had people coming in, um, did a bat survey with another one, came in, did badger survey, I could do that. But they just enjoy seeing people that are actually working and say, how did you get your job, how did I start? Um, so that would be good. We're going to produce uh, a lot of data from these new technologies. So therefore, we need to do a lot more data analysis. We already do perhaps more than you suspect, but we will need to do even more. We will need to know about softwares and apps. Uh, we do GIS as standard. Perhaps there's other things, as we've seen from the presentations coming up, that industry needs to tell us actually you need to start doing this apps, barely touch, to be honest. The students tell me about the apps. You know, I'll say, well, what is this grass? We'll say, hang on. Oh, is this? Somebody's just told me from an app or something like that. And both of these might mean we have more specialist degrees. Perhaps there isn't much room left for an environmental sciences degree or environmental management degree. Perhaps we just need to do an applied ecology degree where we only study ecology in the correct detail that we need to do. Uh, that's all great when we talk about cutting edge technology. Um, the future of ecology, well, when any graduates used to come in and I used to interview, I always used to ask, can you tell me the difference between an oak and an ash tree? And yeah, first class degrees, masters, whatever, and a lot of them really struggled with basic identification skills. So technology is certainly part of the future, but we've also got to take a step back and develop what, what we've struggled to develop in the past. University of Oxford has got the postgraduate certificate in ecological survey techniques to try and go over that. Uh, that's great, I have no problem with that. Um, so you can spend three or four years doing your degree, you can spend another year doing your postgraduate survey and possibly then you might get a job. Um, but we're coming to a time, Northern Powerhouse, HS2, where we simply don't have enough ecological surveyors, people on the ground. What we are trialling, it's not live yet, but we're looking at um, a professional development award in ecological surveying. This is below a degree. This, we start off, ecology and ecosystems, what is an ecosystem? What is a species? And we build up. So you see we've got um, environmental regulation, Ecological surveying, so you do your Great Preston News HSIs, you do your Phase 1 NBC, etc. You learn how to data manage them. Uh, we're not getting into correspondence analysis, but we might do an ANOVAS. And then GIS, what do you need for GIS? We're not talking about programming people at high level, we're talking people to do the jobs that we're going to be lacking very, very soon to be an ecological surveyor. Another aspect of this, this can be done with CPD, but also you have universities like the breadth of your country. Um, some of you might be interested in GIS and you want to do GIS. Where do you actually get GIS from? Um, you could sit a postgraduate degree about £9,000, or why don't you just take a single module in that degree structure and then it'll just cost you maybe a couple of hundred pounds so you get the old day release package. I'll whiz on pretty quickly. This is the research side. Research is always cutting edge. We don't need to worry about that. Um, funding providers are now asking us work more with industry, um, which we want cross-disciplinary, industry relevant, relevant impact publications. Uh, we do this in the big end. We use things like climate change, we definitely do. Um, at the lower end, industry demands a working solution. So for instance, how do we mitigate uh, uh, against um, bad impacts. Um, Consulting's got the data, there will be years of data, and if we can work with academia, um, they can bring in the processing power, they can do reports, and we can end up, this is University of Leeds, um, again to Backbridge, saying the current Backbridges don't 
don't work. So uh, collaboration, tell us what to do and, and having the framework to do that. Okay, thank you. Me. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Max, thank you. to come up with solutions in, in five, ten minutes uh, in, in, in quite a large topic. Um, so paid attention during the uh, morning yesterday, um, and interestingly, the word ecology um, certainly mentioned less than ten times, I counted four. Um, biodiversity, on the other hand, uh, was mentioned loads and loads of times, and I reckon over the next ten years we're fairly safe uh, from a professional point of view that we will be um, spending a lot of time uh, involved in biodiversity or that sort of uh, part of biodiversity that's important to us. Of course, we need to remember we don't cover the sort of full range of biodiversity. Um, that view is based on um, sort of public interest, uh, the sort of media coverage, uh, the legislation that we have, and the sort of likelihood of it changing significantly uh, over, over that sort of period of time. So. Prediction would be things are not going to change greatly. But we have heard uh, of a range of technologies that are going to help us. Help us to be more efficient, help us to be more accurate, uh, help us to be less damaging to the environment and actually safer for us too. Uh, they're not critical developments, but they will um, enable us to do our jobs uh, better in, a, in, in the sense of the biodiversity. But I think thereby hangs a, a, a risk. Um, the majority, I suspect, of us at the conference uh, have, have a, a desire to be outside um, doing surveys, uh, interacting with the environment, uh, chances to see uh, interesting species and go to interesting places. Even if that means getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning, staying up till goodness knows what time at night, and uh, working very long hours over uh, over the season that we can we can work in. However, if all this or parts of this are being done uh, remotely, uh, we've heard uh, all sorts of interesting um, potential. Uh, some of which I'm sure will be realised over the next few years. Is that going to uh, make the profession less interesting? Uh, you are going to have less chance uh, of seeing a, a number of species, great crested newts, for example. Uh, potentially, you you might not ever need to see one if we can develop uh, environmental DNA type techniques. So uh, that uh, could well influence Chris and, and, and academia in terms of you know, who, who's, who's going to fill these jobs um, and, 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 and undertake the, the, the role that uh, is so important to us now, but it could well change. Be interested to see what your views are in that context. There is, however, a really uh, significant opportunity that I believe is in front of us, uh, and that is to uh, look at the ecology and the, and the environmental management uh, within the uh, Chartered Institute of Ecology and Environmental Management. Um, there is a, a, a real potential for us as a profession to uh, engage in uh, an ecological function, uh, understanding how ecosystems work, evaluating ecosystems, uh, in response to uh, where government, business and industry uh, are starting to look uh, in terms of understanding um, how to better manage our, our resources. Um, it's not really part of uh, this discussion, but it is uh, obviously uh, an area that we need to think carefully about in terms of uh, embarking on, on, on that particular journey. But it does really give us a chance to put the ecology and the environmental management at a, uh, at a very meaningful level uh, into our profession. And here I think these technologies that we've been listening to um, throughout the, uh, the two days become really uh, essential uh, because the task is quite a considerable one uh, in, in respect of understanding how ecosystems function, um, looking at as interesting, looking at uh, sort of concepts of volumes of vegetation as well as uh, as distribution. Uh, it's interesting to think about the role of invertebrates, 
well, we can uh, actually have tools that could be available in the next 10 years which could tell us what the invertebrates are, are that are uh, present in, in the systems that we're working on. Whereas at the moment, I, I think being realistic, we haven't got a cat and hell's chance of, of, of managing to do that, be far too expensive, etc. etc. So uh, that's the sort of getting the information, uh, and there'll be lots of it, and we've heard this afternoon how uh, exciting and all sorts of possibilities in terms of dealing with that information. I think as part of that, um, we need to be careful uh, professionally that we carve a niche for ourselves in that process as ecologists, because we do need to remember that the data that are generated by drones or sending off um, material for identification through uh, DNA um, will be available to other professions, uh, others who are already uh, involved in ecosystem services, work, um, natural capital and so on, who are able to use these large data sets um, to come up with ecological uh, solutions which uh, embody ecological principles but actually uh, have not had the input from an ecologist at all. So, Ecology and the potential of technology in our hands, uh, I, I would argue, very exciting and, uh, and, and, and decisions we need to take now, actions we need to take now, uh, if we're going to benefit, benefit fully from them. Thank you. thousands of hectares of land in the county. So we're a resource that both extensively uses ecological skills, knowledge and information and then tries to share it with others. So the second part of the question, will technology have changed the profession beyond recognition? You will know the first character, I hope. A great thing has changed since Charles Darwin, and then here's a more conventional, modern-day ecologist doing a little bit of field survey there, checking tree sparrow boxes. It's maybe a bit, is that better? Um, the last character, with all this amazing technology at our, you know, at our fingertips, will we need people in 10, 20 years' time? This is Atlas. He's, Google, uh, he's Google's new robot. They're training him to walk on rough terrain. He's not very good at it yet. If any of you see the YouTube footage of him going through the woods, he's a bit wobbly. Um, and he needs a big power cable, so he's got some way to go. But um, is, is this the ultimate end point of all this amazing technology? So, obviously, in this conference, we've seen some absolutely fantastic technologies. Many of them are in use now, but they're evolving really, really quickly. And we need to evolve with them as professional ecologists. The sorts of technologies we're using now, I mean here, nightjar tracking, using transponders, um, giving us unbelievably important data. This is in Sherwood Forest, another plug for our Sherwood Forest nightjars, following on from um, Carl's bioacoustic presentation earlier. Um, this is giving us information we never knew. We found out there's a female nightjar, widely believed to be incredibly sedentary in the breeding season, who does a 19-kilometre round trip in one night to go to a really good foraging area really important information about species conservation because how do you draw the boundary of a triple SI or an SPA for nightjar when they move around that much? Stuff we didn't know before, really important. Drones, obviously there's been some incredible presentations today about how UAVs can be used. Really important to supplement ecological field surveys. 
to do things on a large scale, particularly if we're talking about landscape scale conservation. Because we do need to be looking at big areas like that fantastic net project and the work that was done there. And obviously this is somewhere where we can add to the important fine scale ecological survey work on the ground by using remote sensing information as well. Who knows what may happen with more eDNA work for other species. We really need better technology for things like night vision cameras at an affordable price. For us in the NGO sector, that's obviously top on our list of considerations in these straightened times. Obviously, you know, academia and consultancy as well, you're constrained by funds, but as NGOs, we particularly are. We can't afford some of these technologies at the moment, even less so possibly in 10 years' time. So these technologies already are looking forward will help us to be better at what we do as ecologists and as conservationists. Better in providing well-informed conservation advice to other landowners, managing our own nature reserves, our areas of the most important habitats and species in the country, protecting and conserving rare species more effectively, assessing the impacts of our activities as land managers, but also those of other people, looking better at EIA, looking at the evidence for mitigation, compensation, all the things that those of us who are very engaged in planning come across on a day-to-day -day basis, understanding animal behaviour and ecology, particularly across landscapes. This is a white badger. It's an albino badger. We're involved in a badger vaccination programme against bovine TB. We're using basic technology, cages, peanuts, lots and lots of peanuts, um, and really basic, you know, bushnell type cameras doing night filming. So we can monitor the behaviour of these badgers, which better informs and makes us more effective in how we trap them to vaccinate them. So we found out that this albino badger lives in a set with a normal coloured badger that's blind in one eye and another normal coloured badger that has only one ear. So they're a poor little set of kind of cast out badgers from the rest of the group but actually getting on very well. But we need to understand more about really basic behaviour of some of these big, common mammals in our country that we are, we're finding out incredible things from this research that people never knew about badgers. And wouldn't you have thought that a large mammal in the UK that's so obvious we'd know more about it? Just an example, that's before we even start on the rare species. So there's amazing things we can do with some of these technologies as the price comes down and enables us to do this. And if we're going to plan for species and habitat conservation for landscape scale, obviously we need to harness these technologies to help us to do that. So not perhaps get so engaged in the technologies that we perhaps lose sight of the amazing things we can do with them if we think a little bit outside the box. Engaging more people in our work, outside the people in this room, outside the people who are committed ecologists or academics or working in research organisations is incredibly important. We can't change policy unless we can explain to people why it's really important what we do. And I think as a profession, we don't generally do that perhaps as well as we might. So uh, there's a little bit of food for thought because some of these amazing technologies, like telling people the story of night that go to Africa and come back again and how they come back to where they hatched, that's the sort of thing you can engage people with <coughs> to start thinking about ecology. 10 years time, we can be reaping the benefits of working more closely with other professions. And there's undoubtedly going to be lots of complex models and lots and lots more data. Um, I'm very interested, I'm very interested about the big data presentation. But how are we going to use all this effectively? We need highly skilled and experienced ecologists who can interpret data and use it for conservation. And we're all still going to need to know about habitats and species in the field and about ecosystems and how they work. Auto ID packages may work to some certain extent, they can identify that plant. But do they tell you anything about that plant and its relationship to the other plants around it, or to the animals that eat it, or the invertebrates that live on it? We can't lose sight of that. So we're going to need to keep our passion for the importance of what we do as ecologists, because undoubtedly our world is becoming an even harder place for habitats and species. We have the prospect in a few years' time of no EU legislation and no European court to protect our habitats and species will be falling back on the CBD and on the Berlin Convention, which has no teeth, no one to enforce it. There could be no EU funds for land management, which will crucify all the conservation and land management organisations. Have no doubt about that. We can't survive without agri-environment. For all its failings, 
we absolutely depend on it. There's going to be even more pressure for built development. You're all, you're all consultants, a lot of you, you know that. We're going to see more species pushed to the edge of their range by climate change and reduced funds across the whole board for habitat protection and management. Are we ready for this as a profession looking forward? Can we do that? So hopefully, I can see you hovering when you get more slides, don't worry. In 10 years' time, we won't have lost sight of what's important. Habitat conservation and the recreation of diverse landscape scale and robust ecological networks, that's what we need to be using our incredible skills and knowledge and technology for. Species conservation for our rare species and the more commonplace and the restoration of our lost botanical and faunal assemblages. We have a duty to do that at the moment under EU law. Not doing it as well as we might. We're trying. And we really mustn't lose sight of the fact that we need principled, highly skilled ecologists whose aim is to conserve our UK biodiversity and who play an active role in ensuring that development is genuinely ecologically sustainable and that it actually strengthens our ecological networks and doesn't weaken them. And if that's my take home message and my plea to all of you still working in the profession in 10 years time is please don't forget that message because you are responsible, we are responsible for trying to restore our lost ecological networks. And next time you notice to the grindstone writing an e ecological impact assessment and you've got a demanding client, please do remember that. Thank you. <clears throat> right, so the whole point of this, and the three speakers have provided three different aspects of the same question is to open it up to you to partly ask questions but also to actually comment as well because it, it is a debate uh, between us as a profession here today at this conference. Can I ask you though before you speak to wait for the microphones, we've got two microphone stewards, they will come as fast as they can to you with a microphone. So I would ask you to wait until the microphone, you've got a microphone before you speak. So have you got anybody who wishes to start the debate or ask a question? Hi, um, with the technology advances, do you think we're going to trend to um, have to increase our skill sets and broaden our capabilities or are we going to have to become more specialists and work instead with more specialists instead and integrate with them? Professions. Uh, yeah, just pick it up and hello. <laughs> um, I would suspect there'd be more specialism coming along. Um, I'm not sure how other people feel about that because most of us are generalists. But I suspect you will have data ecologists and also consultants. You already have field ecologists and office ecologists. I suspect, yeah. We should stop talking about ecologists and say ecologists and environmental managers, we can kind of forget them. But I, I can see basic networks, neural networks, um, all the rest of it. Can we really teach that in a degree? And would people go to a degree if it was called ecology and data analysis? Is that what you do as a 17 year old? Mm -hmm. So I suspect that we will have to become more specialist with the, the software. Your thoughts? <laughs> no, I just think that some of the stuff that it's hard to learn everything, isn't it? Uh, there's only so much, you know, so many years of life, uh, and uh, big data and UAVs and GIS analysis and all that sort of thing. Um, that I think, although, yeah, we do need to know as much as we possibly can, I think, with new tools coming in and new techniques um, <coughs> we need to work with other specialisms more and uh, work with geographers and GIS specialists and analysts and data analysis, yeah. And I just add from the NGO sector, obviously we don't often have the luxury really of having access to all those specialisms because they're expensive. So in answer to your question, Carlos, I suspect it means that ecologists working in sectors like ours will have to learn even more 
and to try and turn up elements of those specialisms as best they can, but within a kind of a day-to-day -day working environment. So maybe it will vary across the profession, I think, depending on the kind of role that you're doing. I imagine that we will be buying in services. If you look at the way the EDNA is, is, is going, you're getting sort of centres that uh, are providing those particular skills. So I'm not sure as ecologists that we'll need to have that sort of breadth of, breadth of skills. Uh, we'll buy in this extra information because um, engaging with um, UAVs and so on and so forth, it's a, it's, a, it's a technology of its own right and you need to be particularly skilled at it. And that applies to a number of things we've been within hearing about. Uh, I think on the, the converse, I think uh, the comments I was making about engaging in a more ecosystem approach, uh, there I think we become part of a broader team. Um, we heard um, about the example in, in Wales and the, the road scheme and so on yesterday, uh, which are sort of the beginning, if you like, of needing to take other factors into account, which we, as ecologists, are unable to do. We're not trained to deal with the abiotic factors and so on and so forth. Uh, but then the, the, there are economic factors, there are social factors and so on and so forth that an ecosystem services appraisal would, would necessitate. So we need to be part of a, a team. Um, but as, as I said, the risk is if we're not careful um, and don't join the party soon, we won't be part of the team. We could do without us. Okay, there's a question at the back. Thanks. It's not a question actually, it's just a follow up from the last point. So I'm from university, as you know from the previous talk, and what I do in my third year, I, I build up to my third year students, and they do the same analysis that I do in terms of UAVs. So my students graduate knowing how to process UAV data, similar to what I've presented there, and they do that for the dissertations. They can go on and show that to consultancy or whatever and get, hopefully, decent jobs. And most of my good students, not all of them, because they're not all good. They're not here, so I don't care. Um, <laughs> but fundamentally, the good students end up at APEM, um, ACOM, um, RPS Group, there's a, there's a plethora of students who go into Atkins as well. So, you know, so they go into all different places and then compete against me for the same jobs. Just work with us universities. What I would say, from my perspective, I'm working from a statutory agency is that generally we're looking for generalists but what it takes to them is during your career you need to if you want to develop a specialism you need that's what you need to do so that you can offer something additional and i think for the educate i personally think for the education establishments the trick is to give them something different so you can each offer something to the students but actually give them at least the basic grounding that is the basis to allow them to then move off in different directions. Um, so certainly that's where I would come on that. Yeah, just to add to that, so um, often we ask students, every, well, every year we ask students who need dissertation projects. You know, so if you've got a sideline project that you want to have someone take up, then you know, just contact a, a university, not necessarily me, but a university that you're close to. And, and they were probably more than happy to you know, put their good students to you because they want more students in the future. You know, I, I change my, my modules every year, so I'm more than happy to add things to, to those modules. Just like we're probably going to go through accreditation for our environmental management course with CIEEN. So, but, you know, we're always open to change, and if you guys tell us the direction that you want us to go in, then we'll go in that direction for one thing or another. It'd be good to hear from those who are either a student member or a graduate member, because you are at the beginning of your profession, you will be potentially, well, you should be full members in 10 years' time. So you are at the best starting point of what you are looking at. So what, you know, what do you think about what you've seen? Is this is something of interest or... Sector. Um, I think it was quite poor when it came to surveys and natural identification 
and kind of got the similar impressions from people of uh, my peers. Um, but if anything, this um, has made me realise that probably quite a few things on my course are going to be yeah, inadequate in the near future because it's all the stuff which the technology seems to be replacing. Uh, but I think if there's one thing that undergraduate courses need to deal with, it's uh, vocational skills. Because at the minute they're, they offer very little. Does anyone from the. Sorry, as a. Hi, my name is Katie Watson. I'm at Diamond Cone University doing my family and my undergrad. Um, I would totally agree with what the uh, master student just said. Um, I did a summer year as part of my degree, and um, although my course is very practical and I have I did a new survey before I went on placement and things like this, there are things that I only gained from um, doing it in the field, and there's only there's some software and kit that I would probably only um, get access to by working in the industry through software licenses are too expensive maybe for unis to um, to afford just for a small group of ecology students. So um, I would maybe just encourage Fine to work with unis to encourage more summer placements and work experience. So. To to have more to come back to the points that they Yeah, shall I uh, I see uh, Saeem is discussing um, apprenticeships because we, we see the exact same thing. Now, I talk just from my course, we run it three days a week, three full time days a week, and we encourage people and we set up interviews, real life interviews, for them to become, because of, uh, a lot of them are mainly interested in rangers, and that's who we get the feedback from, to, to work with volunteer rangers. And as I said, when we do the industry liaison, they say we want project management skills, and so I teach project management. I teach and charts and everything, and then to say we have the volunteer, that's not volunteer, it's compulsory, range of service, in which the, the student led, the student run, they're the student um, governing body, they have their own bank account, they apply for funds, we could do that with an ecological survey team if it's been demanded, and we're quite happy to go out um, and not just do things on campus, but it needs to be demanded by industry. To know this is what you want, and then you get an idea: is which of these students do you actually want to take on? And, and you, can, you can sort of vet them from the work experience, which we also demand. And our students have to do work experience of some kind. Thomas or Max, do you want to come back on those particular points? Yeah, I'd certainly uh, agree with the young one over there who was talking about lack of ID skills being taught in. All sorts of further and higher education institutions. It's certainly an issue for us as an employer um, that in most places actually we don't employ new graduates. We expect them to have, even for basic entry level jobs into our sector, we expect them to have a whole range of voluntary and other experience. And ID skills is an important part of that as well. We, it's, it's a shame actually because we do get a lot of students. Um, coming to us to ask us what if they can do their master's dissertations with us. And we'd love to be able to give them more opportunities, but sometimes because they don't have really quite basic ID skills to even do quite basic levels of research, it really limits what they can do. And that's, that's a shame because that's not helping them in their future careers at all. But we have limited resources. We can't teach people to have this in three months. Again, there's a, over the next Ten years, there's likely to be a, a sort of dilemma in terms of because I agree with what Janice has just said, but on the other hand, yesterday we heard about all sorts of possibilities uh, in terms of using DNA, which means that uh, the, the next ten years is a, is a growing likelihood we won't need those sorts of skills. We'll need a different sort of skill um, from our ecologists who don't necessarily use the, the techniques that we, we use now. Um, so. Uh, difficult to know exactly how it will work out, but it, uh, it will be different, I suspect, significantly different. Sorry, Mark, my name is Mark Cady. So, just with regard to the skill debate, I think, I mean, I take the graduate's point, but it's, it's also worth remembering that the university can only give you 
so much and it gives you a you know a basic useful grounding that's what the university degree is for and if you want to develop your id skills we'll just go out and film and take a pair of binoculars you know it's it's not something that occurs overnight if you want to become a competent ornithologist it's going to take you 10 years perhaps it stems from a childhood interest and i think increasingly that's the i mean it's all you know interrelated to this lack of association and understanding of the the outside anyway, but if you know that you need to do ID skills, then it can't necessarily, you know, you, you can be taught a certain amount, you can point them in the right direction, but ultimately it's personal interest. It's, I'm not suggesting you get off the backside, but it's kind of, it's kind of that thing, it's, it's, it's there and we shouldn't, I don't think we as a college should expect it all to come from employers. I think one of the, the worst things we do as a consultancy is employ graduates to a certain extent because we give them they often don't have the skills. I mean, I was in exactly the same position when I graduated, so I understand totally where graduates are coming from. But you can develop those skills if you're motivated enough. And it's, you won't get it all through work, you'll get some of it through work, but ultimately it's, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like an apprenticeship. You've just got to accept the fact that you, you know, you never stop learning and you start to point out and you progress as you go and you never stop learning. Just, I think we're going to have to, I'm conscious of time, unfortunately, <coughs> there's a lady at the back who's had a hand up for the longest. Um, I'm Rachel Stubbington, I'm a course reader for uh, an accredited degree at Nottingham Trent, and so I'm deeply disappointed. Um, but um, yes, the skills provision. Um, is, is, is considered, well, I, I don't think you're saying insufficient. I agree with the previous comment that what we can do is so our provision, our practical provision, we found it very easy to greatly exceed what Saeed required as a, as a minimum basis for field skills and the amount of hours that we spend on um, teaching students skills. Um, but I, I think that, that as uh, Janice pointed out, that, that um, there's an expectation that the truly excellent students um, who, who, who want to go into consultancy are going to have that additional um, voluntary uh, experience, going through placements, um, going through working with wildlife trusts, um, perhaps. So I think that, that yes, we, we I, I find that I, I need to keep the provision of the degree quite broad um, in order that it doesn't become an ecologist training course. It needs to be more than that. It needs to develop students who can enter a wide range um, of, of scientific disciplines um, and that it doesn't just attract a few students um, each year, perhaps too few to be um, viable in the long term. Um, so, so yes, I, I think that we should um, yeah, be, be realistic about what um, universities can provide. Thank you very much, everyone. I, I'm sure this is something that we could have gone on for a lot longer. Unfortunately, uh, our final speaker, Peter Gilchrist, uh, has got to keep to a very tight time today, so I'm conscious of that, so giving him a fair time. But can we thank our three presenters? <laughs>